get, you know, 
on the other side of that. I met my husband, Bob, in a bar that only my fake ID told me I was old enough to get into, right? Like, I got what I think at 18, I think I was 20 when we met, um, and after two years of marriage, uh, no, we were married four years but before we had our son, so um, when he was two years old, my oldest son, Jake, when he was two, I can remember I was sitting in the kitchen, and he was getting super frustrated at something. I don't even know what it was. Um, but all of a sudden, he said the F word. And literally, that totally got my attention. I was like, what in the world is happening? Like, what, why would he say that? I thought, do I even say that? My husband doesn't cuss that much. Like, well, obviously, he must have heard it because he said it. But it was one of those moments that made me think and stop and contemplate, what am I teaching my child? Like, what have I taught him that that just came right out of my, his mouth? And I thought, what do I even believe? I literally had that moment, like, what do I believe? Like, I, if, if you asked me, I would have told you I'm a Christian. But the truth is, when my husband and I were looking for spots to get married, we actually ended up getting married in a Lutheran church. And not because we were Lutheran, but because it was closest venue to our venue. And because the church, I believe it was of Scientology, or it might have been of science, had red carpet, and that was very off-putting. So that kind of gives you the idea of where my heart and my head was, although I knew I did have this very real fear that if the rapture came, I wasn't going. So I knew there was one, so I was just kind of this bit of a mess. And so that Sunday, I remember telling my husband, I'm going to church. I'm going to go to church, and I invited him to go with me. And he said, um, Sunday is pretty much my day of rest because I've been working really hard all week long, so I really don't want to go. And I thought, okay, all righty. So I went to church, and I selected a church based on, I've heard a few people talk about this church, you know, in, in the years that I lived in Anaheim Hills. And it was also, I knew where it was, so I thought, well, I won't get lost, and that's a bonus. So I went that day just to sit down and see, do I believe in Jesus? And I can remember sitting in that pew and just sitting down and hearing the message. And his name was Pastor John. I'll never forget him. And as he was giving the message, it was like the Holy Spirit was speaking only to me. Have you ever had that moment where the word of God became so alive to you that I was like, Oh my Lord, like it felt as if that very moment I became a new creation in Christ. And I was so excited and I felt this sense of peace. Um, but it was one of those things that when I went home and was telling my husband, he wasn't super excited about it. Like he didn't really get what I was saying. He didn't really understand. And what was one of the greatest days for me, I look back, brought me one of the greatest challenges in my marriage because when you are divided in Christ it does really change the, the kind of relationship that you are capable of having and that's just the truth and, and it really kind of bugged me about because I no longer wanted to see the same movies that we used to go see and I no longer wanted to go to the same comedy shows that he wanted to go see um, and the way I spoke began to change I started reading my Bible and then I started inviting him to church more and more I really didn't even drink as much as I did in the past. And all this transforming and renewing of my mind, my husband was thinking, I like the old you better. Because that's who I married. And this sanctifying work that was going on inside of me only irritated my husband. And I can remember this one day that it was, it was one of those things that sticks out in my memory because he literally looked at me, and it was probably after a year or so, of being a Christian, he looked at me and said, I did not marry my grandma Susie. And I thought, that's bad. Like, my, and let me tell you, Grandma Susie was an amazing, God-fearing woman who any one of us in this room would be thankful and honored to have been compared to, but if you would have heard the way he said it, you knew it wasn't a compliment. And it was that moment where I thought, this guy's got to get saved fast or we are in trouble. And I began witnessing because I thought in my angst of wanting to fix my marriage, because I love my husband. My husband's great. Um, and I just wanted to make sure he got saved. So I started witnessing to him, to him all the time. All the time. And 
I started telling him, you know, I know you think you're saved, but you're not. Like he told me one time that he didn't hear, need to hear about being born again because he was born into it. His family, he came from a very godly family, his aunts and uncles, so he didn't grasp what being born again meant at all. And so he just felt like, I'm good to go, and I don't know what you're doing. You're making a whole lot of big deal out of nothing. And so me worried he wasn't saved, kept trying to tell him all the reasons he was going to hell based on everything that he was doing. And for some reason, that was not all that attractive to him. And it didn't draw him closer to God. It was like every time he looked at me, I know he had to be thinking, oh, my Lord, what is she going to say now? And I would talk to him about Jesus all the time, and I, would, and I would try and tell him over and over again just about who God was, but it wasn't necessarily in the way that was going to speak to him. And so, ladies, I just want you to hear my heart for those of you who are struggling with this issue. The things I'm sharing right now is not your go-to. It's not your go-to. I'm going to share your go-to. But I thought that I was the Holy Spirit. I really did. I took that job seriously. I almost beat him up with the Bible so many times. And I thought in my desire to have him know Jesus that I was actually doing something good for him. And it wasn't good at all. All the things I had done, had it been prompted by the Holy Spirit and in love, might have made a difference. But my approach was absolutely pointing out all his sin, being the God's God, letting him know, dude, you die tomorrow, you're going to hell. And it never moved him. I was not qualified to take the job of the Holy Spirit because, you see, someone already has that job. God has that job, and it wasn't up to me. I didn't need to tell him all the times what he was doing was wrong. It doesn't mean I shouldn't witness to him and I shouldn't have ministered to him, but the approach that I used was not working. And if I'm honest, it doesn't work on anyone. So say you have a saved husband, let me know if you're sharing Jesus. Don't use that approach with others either. Because when you use bully tactics, it doesn't draw people to Christ, does it? It just doesn't. We as believers are called to be salt and light, right? But not the kind of spotlight that we shine in someone's eyes two inches from their face. What does that make them want to do? Look away, right? We are to be the light of Jesus. And we are to emulate Christ. And after much frustration and disappointment, I realized what I was doing was not right. We just bickered more. We debated all the time. And I, at one point, regretted that I even got married because I knew at that point that the Bible said that we were unevenly yoked. And I thought if I just would have been walking with the Lord before I got married, I wouldn't have made this mistake. And now the only way the Bible's letting me out is if he cheats on me. And it's a really bad thing to actually contemplate what I want him to cheat on me so that I could go. Like it's scary where your heart will go sometimes when you're frustrated and you're struggling and you're feeling lonely. I felt sorry for myself. Sometimes I blamed him, and sometimes I blamed me. I wasn't, um, I was one of those people that on one day it was going to be his fault, and the next day it was like, oh, if I wouldn't have, only if I wouldn't have had, had, had married him. All of those things. My light was not shining for Jesus. And that's when I read 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'll tell you what I love about God and his word is that there is no subject that is not spoken of or there for us. It, that's not in his word. Everything we need to know, every example we need, everything we're struggling or wondering about is in the word of God. And when I found 1 Peter 3, I was talking to a friend last night, and we were kind of sharing her husband wasn't saved either, and she said she found 1 Peter uh, 3, her first month of, mar of, of being saved. I was like, well, good for you. It took me three years to find that in the Bible. And so she was just saying how she knew right away the heart of God and, and how she should minister to her husband. And I thought we should all know this and we should all read it. Um, our, struggling, our struggles that we have, sometimes we bring on ourselves. So if you're struggling in this room and you're thinking, okay, I totally relate. I get that. I've done that. Listen closely. Because God has a way to minister to our husbands, and it's through his word, and it's through his Holy Spirit, and it's through us behaving 
like Christ. This is how we should walk in the Spirit. It says in 1 Peter 3, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even some that do not obey the word, that they without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So submit. I know it's no one's favorite word in this room, right? Nobody loves to submit, but biblical submission is not what the world makes it out to be, is it? It's a military term, and it, it means rank. So somebody has to be the head. We can't all be the head. So God designed it this way. I was thinking of an example of I have triplet boys that share one car with many driver's licenses. And I pictured, like, all of them trying to get to school in the morning and all three of them sitting in the driver's seat. You know what I'm saying? Like, we go, well, we all are, can drive. We're all equal here. Let's all drive together. And then getting in the car, lap on lap, and trying to get somewhere. Somebody has to get out of the way. Somebody has to be the driver, right? We can't all be the drivers. And God understood that, which is why he put the husband in, in charge of the home. Does that mean that we don't share our hearts, that we don't speak our mind, that we don't encourage? No, that's not what that means. It just means ultimately... The heavy decisions lie on him after much conversation and contemplation together as husband and wife, right? Um, I admit submitting even to the most godly man can be difficult for a woman, right? I, I'm kind of bossy. I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty straightforward. One of my gifts is being honest to a fault. No, well, maybe not to a fault. But uh, that's what I'm, I love to just, if you want to know how those pants look on you, ask me. If you don't want to know, don't ask me. Because I feel like if I'm asking you, how does this look? And you go, yeah, good. But you walk away and thinking, oh my gosh, I should have told her. I'm going to tell you. So that's who I am. But submitting to a godly man is hard. Submitting to an ungodly man is even harder. But when it says obey without a word, um, it doesn't mean that you don't ever speak. It's talking about what our words should be, our actions. Like when we don't have to, I don't have to say I love Jesus. My life should show I love Jesus, right? Shouldn't your life show that you love Jesus? It says they are also won by our conduct. Okay? Our conduct. So that begs the question, what should our conduct look like? And I think we all kind of know, you know, how we should or shouldn't behave. But the Bible has things to say about our conduct. In marriage, what are we to our husbands? What does Genesis say? It says we are created to be their helper. Do you feel like you're your husband's helper or are you his hinderer? Sometimes it's a fine line, right? We were created to be their helper. What does it say in Proverbs 31? That the heart of our husbands should safely trust us. That means we're their biggest advocate. It says that we do him no harm. Can we say that's always our heart for our husband? Ephesians says that we should respect our husbands, doesn't it? Sometimes that's hard to do when we don't like the decisions they make. Is it sometimes really difficult to actually respect? Like, I don't respect that. But we go with our husband because even when they fail, God can use it. Even when they fail. I've allowed my husband, I, things I've seen that I thought, oh my gosh, that's a train wreck. I've shared what I thought, and when it went in the wrong direction, you know what he said to me after? I should have listened to you. I should have listened. You know what I didn't say? I told you so. You know why? Because the more I didn't say I told you so, the more he came and asked what my thoughts were. The more it wasn't a battle between him and I winning and who's in charge and who's the boss and who knows better, it was about just the relationship. And sometimes it would be good and sometimes it wouldn't. And he would recognize, gosh, my wife may have a few good things to say. And our marriage was much more unified in that. Those are the things that draw him, drew him to Christ. Even the word says how we should be acting to our husbands, how we should behave. But our conduct, it should be also to other believers as well. This message isn't just about how you act solely to your husbands, but it's how you act to, uh, as a Christian to other believers. We should be growing in the image of Christ, right? And so what does that look like, the fruits of the Spirit? It's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's all Ephesians 5.22. 
This is the kind of conduct that will not only win over our husbands, but it's going to win over our friends as well, right? Without a word never means silence. When I read that the very first time, I remember thinking to myself, I don't ever shut up. How can I ever do anything without a word? But my actions, the things I said that were in love and kind, and just behaving as a Christian, showing that God was, that Jesus was the Lord of my life, that's what eventually spoke to my husband. Those were the things that years later, and, and really, honestly, it might take a month for some husbands. It might take a year. It took mine five years. It might take yours 15 years. But it doesn't change how we are responsible to the Lord. Because you see, when I submit to my husband and to God's word, I'm submitting to God, right? It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty and a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Incorruptible beauty. What is that? That means that it does not diminish with age. That's incorruptible beauty. It's not talking about what's on the outside. What's on the outside of me is going south in a big hurry. What's on the inside, right? What's on the inside? It says it is incorruptible. It's the kind of beauty that is drawn closer to the Lord through the sanctification process is what draws others to Christ. And it's that incorruptible beauty that we should all desire to have. How long do we spend every morning on makeup, hair, clothes, nails, all of those things that focus on the outside of us, right? The older I get, the longer it takes. Or sometimes the less I care. It just depends on the day. But how long do we spend on that? And not that it's a bad thing. That's, it's not that it's bad. It's like, but what do you compare the amount of time that you spend on the outside to the amount of time that you spend on the inside? How much time are you spending on your mommy blog? On social media? Maybe a five-minute devotion, devotion that you're doing. A quick prayer up to God for grace that you can handle your husband that day, right? That's not really working on the inside. And I'm not suggesting that you little ones have tons of extra time in your day that you can sit and be a theologian and read all day long and study all day long. But I would ask you to balance and take a really good look at the amount of time you're spending in areas that you don't need to spend so that you can work on what's on the inside. Because that's what's the most important thing. If you want to walk on this, walk in the spirit, you cannot rely on the flesh to feed your soul. I know for me, the flesh always takes me right to sin. Doesn't it you? My flesh does. Anyway, it says, For in this matter, in former times, this is 1 Peter 3, 5, For in this matter, in former times, the holy women of God who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. And Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are uh, You are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. What does that mean? For example, Sarah, a holy woman of, of God, it says, it says she trusted in God. Abraham made some blow-up moments, right? And, and Sarah followed her husband. Even in places she could have said, oh, you're going to be wrong there. You're going to be wrong there. But she trusted in God, therefore she submitted to her husband. And I think we need to understand when we submit to our husbands, when we love our husbands, when we follow and, and love uh, God in that way, we're submitting to him ultimately, right? And that's what everything we do is as unto the Lord. And let me tell you, Sarah made some blow-up moments herself. Hagar was one of them, a big one. But she lived with that consequence, didn't she? We are not perfect women, always doing things perfectly, are we? But we are women that love God and should follow after him with the heart that he's called us to. We should take that new creation in Christ that we are meant to be seriously and say, what does my life look like? It wasn't for five years before my husband began joining us for church. And I, at that point, had two kids and was taking both of them in tow every week by myself. Ladies, you can go to church by yourself. 
It's okay. And my husband didn't get mad I went to church without him. He have a great time. Enjoy it. But I went faithfully hoping and praying that one day my obedience to the Lord would minister to him. And it did. And you know what? It wasn't really so much me that that made the greatest change in him. He started on his drives to work listening to Greg Laurie. And then he started playing it at home. And then we started having dialogue and conversation because I was no longer that angry woman lording Jesus over him. I was someone he could talk to. And that's what we need to be in our marriages for our husbands. That soft place to fall, not the, I told you so, right? And I will say it all came for a full circle last June um, when my husband's grandma Susie passed away. Loved her dearly. She died at 96 years old. And the neat thing about her, my husband was asked to speak about her at her funeral. And so he got up there and he was sharing just what an amazing godly woman she was and, and how uh, she ministered to him as a child and how she was this great example. And at the very end, he shared the story that I never knew he ever really thought about, about how he had looked at me angry and said, I did not marry my grandma Susie. And he said, I meant that at the time to all of his family and everyone. I meant it at the time as an insult, but I could not be more proud to be married to a woman that I would consider like my grandma Susie. And literally, I was sobbing, obviously, in the room that day because it really wasn't anything specifically I did other than follow the word of God. And, and I am thankful and grateful 28 years later that my husband loves the Lord and serves the Lord. And I am grateful that it was only five years. But I just want to encourage you women here that maybe it's been five years and you're thinking, Gloria, it's already been five. Maybe it's six, maybe it's five and a half. We need to be faithful to Christ in our walks before we can affect anybody. Do you agree with that? And it doesn't matter. Some of you might be thinking, I need my child saved. I need my friend saved. I need my mother saved. This applies in all of our relationships, ladies. We need to walk with Jesus genuinely. They can tell, do you know people can tell when you're not genuine? <laughs> you can't fake it that good for that long. You could probably fake it for a minute in a few conversations, but you can't fake it for long. And our husbands know when we're genuine and when we're not. That's one of the beauty of marriages. You can say something any way you want to say it. You know they actually get the hidden point, right? Just kidding. That's not good at all. We're supposed to be genuine. So ladies, I want to encourage you this morning that if you are in a place where you are discouraged or you're frustrated, and where you're thinking this isn't going to end well, trust God. Trust God with absolutely everything. And that includes your marriage, your children, your family. Trust him with everything. Amen?